Hey, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that together we can make it happen. I'm Manda Scott, and I spent the first series of this podcast laying out the basic toolkit that we think is essential to making conscious evolution a possibility, which is the entire premise behind the whole Accidental Gods project, this podcast, the website, and the membership program that lies behind it. We spent the second series exploring that intersection between art and activism, politics and philosophy, science and spirituality, that could help us see the ways that we can make this happen. And now in the third season, we are beginning to find the people who are living the vision for making that more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. And my guest this week exemplifies the best of this. I invited Benjamin Ross onto the podcast in his role as the lead for media and alliance building for One Nation Politics, which is a model for a whole new governance structure and the ways we might reach it. But the conversation turned into so much more than that. Benjamin describes himself as an evolutionary mythmaker, a meta-coherence steward, and a nurturer of emergence and lover of all beings. And in our exploration of all this, we talked for nearly an hour and a half. So, in the spirit of not wanting to overload you, we have split this into two separate podcasts. And this is the first. So, people of the podcast, please welcome Benjamin Ross. So welcome, Benjamin Ross, to the Accidental Gods podcast. You're calling in from New Mexico, which is a first for us. And I'm guessing it's incredibly beautiful and sunny for you out there. Is that the case? You know, in the, the high desert of New Mexico, we, we have monsoon season this time of year, which I, I didn't know before moving here. So it's um, a combination of intense sun and um, and rain and the soil is is soft. and um, Wow. Mm-hmm. And are you, we will discuss in a bit the community that you're at, but just for me, because I'm looking at hydroengineering as we speak, are you collecting all this water? Because I guess you need it for the rest of the year. So it's an interesting aspect of the project that we're creating here. Um, there's an ephemerality to Azure Village that's in some ways, we're not the ideal eco-village. We're not producing all of our own food. We're not completely off of the grid. Um, And so a lot of these long-term regenerative solutions, although they're things that we're incredibly passionate about, um, we're here for a a five-month period of time during which we're intending to organize large-scale political movement. And so our energy, well, we maintain a very minimal footprint and um, try to make choices as intentionally as possible. There are ways in which um, we're not fulfilling the ultimate dream of, of the eco-village in this particular instance, I think primarily because um, in this window of time ahead of the U.S. election, there's um, so many interdimensional weaving that we're doing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's a very good lead-in to what we're going to be talking about this week. So before we really get into the politics, can you introduce yourself to us who you are and how you became involved in the One Nation concept? Mm -hmm. So my name is Benjamin Ross, and um, I'm the lead for media and alliance building for One Nation. Um, I really never thought for most of my adult life that I would come back into politics because it was something that um, had meant a great deal to me in my childhood. And um, I grew up very concerned about the state of the world. And and I think I actually encoded a lot of um, trauma in not feeling like that care and concern was understood or received by my peers or by the people around me. Yeah. I carried that weight with me for a very long time, feeling like I had a moral obligation to speak the truth on behalf of those who couldn't speak it. And and well, that was noble and good. It, it created a, a sense of victimization within me right. that was deeply part of my own 
healing journey. And, and so as I came out of the depression and anxiety of my late teens and early twenties, when I, I realized that so many of my heroes in the political sphere, I, I, been very active when I was 18 years old campaigning for Barack Obama and Mm. was so disheartened by the drone warfare, by the deportations, um, among many other moments of disillusionment where that childhood naivete was stripped away. And, and I stayed in that kind of existential despair until I began to have access to healing and mindfulness technologies from different cultures all over the world. And, and I, mm-hmm. I began to walk a very inner path of, of moving through all of the, those shadows of my childhood. And, and I really thought that that process was incongruous with all of those political um, notions of my past, that I associated politics with that trauma, that politics was a domain in which there was duplicity, there was manipulation, there was power and domination. Hmm. And so things finally came full circle um, within the last year where after a long journey into um, uh, filmmaking and working with indigenous peoples to help bring messages from indigenous leaders to the world, that led me back into the the political sphere where I, I realized that through actually encountering One Nation for the first time that uh, my sense of inner spiritual life didn't actually need to be in conflict with how I um, provided leadership or giving my life force to a, to birthing a new political system that's based on a new set of values. And so it's been beautiful to be at the the birth of that energy and to find all of these other people whose journeys are different, but remarkably similar that this path in eventually leads you back out into the world. Um, and, and that it's from that place that I think we're all tapping into the same essential wisdom that lives inside of us, that lives inside of nature. Um, and so we can be having this conversation on, yes, you know, two different continents with an ocean in between us. And yet I feel that we're, we're connected to the same undercurrent of life that's guiding us to do the work that we're doing. That is so beautiful, Ben. Totally. Thank you. And so interesting in so many ways we could go. Just because Accidental Gods is quite devoted to healing and mindfulness, was there anything in particular that helped you to begin healing or is that it may be too personal, but it may also be that there was just uh, an accumulation of inner work that led you to finding balance. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because you know these patterns of trauma. I I've recently come to this image of um, my distant ancestors um, who come from Scotland and, and Ireland. Scotland, yeah. And I imagine those ancestors wrapping my DNA in a dark cloak of trauma coping mechanisms, of ways to survive the pain of, of being stripped of your spiritual lineages, the pain of relocating. And, and I've been tuning in with my parents to learn more about this lineage of trauma and depression and um, and to understand how mm. the ideas of whiteness, the ideas of um, masculinity and, and patriarchy have been encoded into my DNA. Because I, I do believe, similar to what's expressed in the, the gene keys, that our, our genetic information itself is changing as we heal. And there's epigenetic science that shows that actually we, as we, uh, that we're actually recreating our DNA and where we can, we carry this memory within, within ourselves. And so, you know, at a, in a linear sense, that journey began through access to uh, Vipassana meditation and going, going into silence for 10 days 
And that first experience, I, I came out of that experience without almost any anxiety. And I'd come into that experience deeply anxious socially and professionally and personally. And that just be- opened up a, a self-reflective journey where so much of, I think, the, the pain that many people born into male bodies carry is you know, the the way in which patriarchy or any sort of culture of domination, I think you, there's there's a, a substrate to it that you could, it's, it's almost superficial to just call it patriarchy, but um, there are ways in which we've been severed from our multidimensionality, our complexity, our wholeness, and we've been culturally conditioned to perform various identities in order to belong. Mm. And so for me, masculinity was one of the first to go um, where I started to realize, actually, there's a, a feminine part of me that I've hated and I've suppressed. Wow. And as soon as I, I opened up just a little bit of space inside of myself for that to be okay, it was like I, had, I was missing half of my body or I was a bird with one wing just flying in circles and that through coming into wholeness with the feminine aspects of myself, then paradoxically these, these new expressions of masculinity started to come online. It's like, how did I get back back to masculinity through my femininity? It's, and and so that has been one major aspect of that journey is 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 coming into to that expression of wholeness. And you know, there's so many different ways to be whole. There's so many different parts of ourselves, and so many different ways to be broken, also. Mm-hmm. But having the courage and the integrity to go into the depths of that is huge. Thank you so much for sharing that. In a way, I would really like to explore that more deeply, but let's we'll, let's park that for a moment and, and look then at the evolution of the One Nation Party and, and its spiritual evolution, because it, as I understand it, it grew out of people such as yourself understanding the toxicity of the existing system and then striving to find an alternative that is workable in our in the system that we have now, because an awful lot of alternatives are predicated on systemic change first, and then we can do wonderful things, whereas actually we need to create the systemic change. And One Nation seems to me one of those ideas that has the potential to create the systemic change. So can you describe a little bit about the evolution of what, of the mm-hmm. One Nation Party and how it how it arose and its first year of experimenting, I guess. I think that the it's beautiful that the other part of my healing process is so deeply connected to the answer to this question because it centers on the the reintegration of indigenous peoples and indigenous wisdom into our broader sociocultural context, that severing or that cutting off, I believe is actually at the core of, of how, at least those of us who've been in a particular westernized culture, have cut ourselves off from our own indigeneity. Yeah. We cut ourselves off from the landscapes in which we lived. We've cut ourselves off from one another. We've cut ourselves off from um, these deeper sources of wisdom and truth are our feminine power. Mm. And so there's a, a coming, there's a returning that I feel is happening that is at the heart of, of One Nation's evolutionary process, that how can we integrate the best of our technology and our um, all of the ways in which we've advanced in some senses while simultaneously integrating the the wisdom and the awareness of the interconnections of the natural web of life and and can our our governance systems actually be a perfectly harmonized expression of the natural living systems complex self-organization you know there's no domination hierarchy in nature there are there are hierarchies but the you know the lion is the steward 
the lion is actually responsible for maintaining the health of the ecosystem. And there are subtle and not subtle ways in which we can actually observe these um, keystone species being of service to the, the, the complex interconnectedness of an ecosystem. And so as humans who are becoming conscious and, and, and becoming conscious of how evolution works, it starts to just sort of become self-evident that our, our governance systems, it once made conscious, will be I- identical to nature. Totally. Yes, this is so exciting. And so this is an idea. It feels like an idea whose time has come. How is it being made to happen? Because you have got till November in the US. You've One Nation has been a working idea, I think, for a year, gathering people such as yourself, moving down to New Mexico. Can we look a little bit about the timeline of the last year and then about at how we move forward in an effort, I guess, to change the nature of politics in real time. Yes, there's something quantum about this moment. I think we've seen that the world can change very rapidly in the last few months. And I don't see any sign of that stopping. We're about to go into a 10-day silent retreat, which seems paradoxical given all of the things that are happening and this sort of the sense of scarcity of time between now and November. But I, I deeply trust that this is an idea whose time has come. We are, we're guided by forces beyond our ability to perceive. Um, there's so many little signals. I, mm. I would love to learn more about what's happening in the UK, but there's so many little things, these little um, seedlings that have clearly begun to germinate and they're poking their first roots and stems. Most notably, there's a, a project called Unity 2020, or the, the Articles of Unity. And what makes it most notable is that Brett Weinstein, who brought it forward, is a well-regarded political intellectual and a somewhat polemical figure based on um, his relationship to conversations around race at Evergreen College, um, where he made a name for himself by um, calling for dialogue in a conversation about racial injustice that positioned him as the enemy. And it's very complex, but he, in that process, gained some notoriety in what's called the intellectual dark web, which is a a group of thinkers (laughs) who... um, have at great risk to their personal careers um, taken intellectual positions outside of the orthodoxy. And so it's fascinating because it ends up being a home to Hmm. men's rights activists and some white supremacists and, um, and, and Zionists. And there's a lot of different fringe intellectual identities that it's become um, sort of disallowed to speak publicly with these sets of identities and so they've kind of gone underground and that's where the intellectual dark web got its name Mm. but brett is one of the more um holistic thinkers of that group of people i feel and um and his idea which he brought forward on the joe rogan podcast to over five million people was the notion that um neither political candidate or party um could effectively provide the leadership necessary to navigate the interweaving crises of our present moment. And that he proposed an idea of of bringing together a center-right and a center-left candidate to run as a duo. And and so this is seed number one. (laughs) Okay, And and he has written a Medium article about that, hasn't he? Because I've read, I remember reading it. About a month ago? Yes, and since then galvanized a team of volunteers and is doing everything that he can to make it real. So just before we look, I guess I'd like to talk more about your 10-day silent retreat and and the place where you're doing it, but as a purely logistical thing, somebody else, some film star, can it, West or something, put his name down and, and it lasted like five minutes to run for president. But I gathered at that point, and this was a couple of weeks ago, that it was already too late in at least five states 
to put your name on the ballot. Have we not passed through a time gate on this? Well, it's interesting. The the theory that One Nation is working with, because Christopher, who founded One Nation, is officially running for president. Oh. And he has filed to be a write-in candidate, which um, means that his his name will be recognized um, by the Federal Elections Commission, but it will not. He won't have direct ballot access. Okay. Um, and I think we we there's ways in which the system itself is designed to reinforce the the polarity and the duality of the two party system. Oh yes, and ballot access is just one <laughs> way. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting things that have been happening around voter suppression and with the the virus um, being a justification for closing down voting um, for predominantly people of color and low-income people. Um, and so there's a lot of unknowns around even, you know, will the election be able to happen? Will there's There's so much tension mm-hmm. in the United States now that, you know, Portland has been protesting for 56 days straight and the federal government has sent yeah. armed troops with live ammunition to go protect this federal courthouse. And that's the closest in, in my lifetime that I've ever seen uh, to a civil war here in the United States. That's that's the energy of polarization reaching its fever pitch. And the vision that I've been holding is that regardless of who is elected in November, that on November 5th, the day after the election results are tallied, similar to the the women's march after Trump was elected, but this time it will be a national unity march. And there will be hundreds of thousands of people in cities around the country creating a mandate for whomever is holding that office that we the people are standing up against corruption and we're standing for a world in which all beings are respected, all life is respected, and in which we do that which must be done to preserve this the sac- inherent sacredness of life. Okay, so that's fast forwarding to November 5th. Let's take a step back a little. You said Christopher, who was the founder of One Nation, is running for president. So let's just, can you walk us through the founding of One Nation and what its kind of original charter mm-hmm. is? What it is and, and what is it's aiming to do? Yes, so... Um, One Nation began two years ago, actually, and j- on July 4th. And the intention was to create a new domain of political organizing that we call the political rise. It's largely inspired by the work of people like Daniel Schmachtenberger um, and people like Ken Wilber and Integral Theory that there's a lateral domain left and right, and there's also a vertical domain. And that vertical domain is associated with um, psychological development, spiritual development, that our evolutionary process is not static. We're continuously evolving. And to claim that as a domain of politics, that actually the the vertical axis isn't just something you do on, on your mat, but it's something that you can actually bring into discourse, bring into relationship. And... This, uh, this other notion is um, all-win politics. And that comes out of the, the notions of, of omni-consideration, um, that as we, as we move along that vertical axis, as our awareness expands and our circle of care expands, we're actually able to hold consideration for more parts of the whole. And so all-win is an ideal, it's an asymptote that we are forever approaching that brings in more and more perspectives, allows us to consider more and more experiences and and believes that there are actually solutions in which all human beings' needs are met and all human beings' perspectives are integrated. There's an integral synthesis that anytime polarity emerges, there's actually 
something new that wants to be birthed. Mm. When when two opposites come together, they give birth to um, something exquisite. And for me, there, there's also the spiritual connotation of of the Christos Sophia, um, which is you know both the infinite made finite and the masculine merging with the feminine. And so it's, it looks kind of like a medicine wheel. I, th- I believe that's where the cross actually comes from. It's two polarities being integrated simultaneously. Oh, interesting. And so that intention is a lofty one. And, um, and putting that into practice has looked like mostly um, articulating this vision and inviting people who are aligned with that vision to engage in some way and, and meet each meet each other. We've, we've run chapter programs where um, we've had group, small groups meeting regularly. We've had um, programs where we've had members connecting with one another. And all of these have been really small scale initial experiments of what, what would a political party within this domain actually look like. And I think now we're getting ready to take the political organizing aspect of what it is that we're here to do much more seriously. Um, and in some ways, I think now the world is ready for it in a way that it actually wasn't two years ago. Mm. And possibly wouldn't have been as ready without mm-hmm. the pandemic, which clearly nobody yeah. planned for. So so what does a political party, an omni win what Schmachtenberger, I think, would still call game B. Game A is win-lose, zero-sum, somebody wins, somebody else loses, whoever loses is deeply unhappy, whoever wins never feels really safe. And we move instead to this world where all human and all planetary needs are met, where all perspectives are taken into account, where there is the capacity for conversation and the meeting of minds, and I'm guessing an integral part of this is nonviolent communication or systems similar to that. How does that fit with being a political party when the nature of party in our existing system is one of tribalism and us versus them? We, we like to say that um, everyone is a member of one nation. And and that's not to force an identity frame onto anyone or say that we are the only political party of the future. I envision a world in which there are as diverse of political parties as there are of cultural subgroups and people that without becoming factional and, and without becoming separative, um, there's, we, we like to work with the notion of sovereign unity. And once we get into these sort of game B areas, um, things get a little bit paradoxical. Mm. So how could you be completely sovereign? How could you be the sovereign of your domain, which is you? And how could you simultaneously be completely surrendered to your purpose within the complex living system of, of life? And how can I be completely myself and in doing so be completely integrated into the body of humanity that I am just one cell within? And, and so it's really a cultural shift that I think happens first um, in order for people to even really relate to this kind of a political party because it's, it's, we've been so enculturated to think of parties along the lines of, mm. of in-group and out-group. Yeah. And I think that cultural shift for me has a lot to do with identity. I identify with life. There's a part of me that identifies as life. Um, I, I, am, I am life right. Benjamin Ning. I, I am a verb. I am not a noun. And, and that verb is an emanation of a complex system that I'm part of. I wouldn't be me if you didn't exist the ways in which you've changed the world just by your being here is completely connected to who I am and and how I think of myself. And so when my identity frame begins to shift to actually see you as actually a part of me, 
and me as a part of this greater whole, then, then these, these labels just become tools that we can use to sort through the complexity of information, but they don't become these fixed labels that I base my entire life around identifying as a Democrat or a Republican. And, and that's very threatening. There's, there is a death pro- process that, that is happening now where those identifications are, are being stripped away. Um, or there's a deeply painful holding on to them. And that's almost more painful than, than actually j- jumping into that dissolution of self. Yeah. So what we're talking about, what you are manifesting, is a political manifestation mm-hmm. of interbeing, of, of Joanna Macy's turning towards life and then finding how that can integrate with governance systems that take the sense of interbeing as the absolute foundation of everything that arises from them. Which means, if I'm understanding you correctly, that what we have then is a way of approaching governance that is not predicated on economic growth and has a reason for being, which is the beingness, the being the verb, the being of the interconnected, which is, for me, hugely exciting. I haven't heard anybody else articulate as clearly or as succinctly or in a way that sounds like it has real-world impact what it would look like if we actually took turning towards life as the foundation of our being. So in your groups, in the ways that you are expanding this, are you finding that this idea is taking hold? I have an image of of kind of lighting one end of a <laughs> of a flow of petrol and just watching it go whoom, across the whole planet because because it seems to me that anybody wherever they are on left right spectrum if they can let go of the tribalism and I speak as someone who has <laughs> in the not very distant past been extremely politically tribal. So Uh, But I still find the idea, uh, partly because my side lost, I guess, and that's deeply distressing, but the idea of not being tribal, the toxicity of the tribalization and and what it does to the energy around people is so unpleasant and sticky and nasty that if we could find ways for people to experience the sense of release and relief and growth and awe and wonder and connection that comes out of the letting go and the embracing of something new that I struggle to imagine how anybody would not want to do it. So how is it taking off, are you finding? This is exactly the the moment where we're being asked to to show the world what this would look like. And and that's where I do feel a sense of Mm -hmm. pressure within my nervous system to um, both fully bring myself forward and also do so in a way that um, creates this kind of experience for a critical mass of people before November. Because I f- agree, it for me, it was this undeniable longing and, and f- is so completely satisfying to, there's a, a feeling when coherence emerges in a room after a period of conversation where there's a, a silence because there's nothing else left to say. And everyone feels like if there's this kind of dripping feeling of um, connection and understanding. And it's, it's such a powerful feeling that the way that I'm, I'm orienting to creating these experiences for individuals is through a series of um, a series of broadcasts of councils of leaders who are stepping into leadership from this place of sincere care for the thriving of all life, and and connecting those live streamed broadcasts to a digital democracy platform that we're building. Um, it's actually quite simple. Um, anyone can log on and create a proposal. Anyone can vote on a proposal that they think would be a good idea. 
And because it's not the 1700s, we can actually vote on <laughs> on multiple axes simultaneously. So I can rate a proposal not just on my level of agreement, but also um, how feasible it is, how much uh, potential impact for for harm or for benefit it creates, um, what the expected cost will be, all sorts of com complex ways of, of activating collective intelligence. So we get a lot of people bringing their perspectives into the voting process. So it's not just yes or no. Right. And then these proposals, once they, the, the ones that rise to the top will be brought into these councils and the councils will be a space for this kind of political dialogue to take place and for people to ask questions and um, dive deeper into each other's experiences. And one other aspect that I'm exploring with this idea is, is you know, how does healing and the t speaking of truth integrate into our, our political discourse? Because there's so much collective trauma and I feel mm. you know, part of the reason why there's so much cultural dissonance between Black Lives Matter and certain people with, with other belief systems is that the pain of black people in the United States has not been fully felt by the majority of Americans. Right. Most people don't have an embodied understanding of what it's like to be afraid for your life when a police officer pulls you over yeah. for a reason that you don't understand or that for something even small like running yeah. a stoplight or just jogging and so yeah. or just yeah. being yeah yeah yes and can i ask as someone who's not in the u.s so you, we talked a little bit about your work with indigenous peoples does the same level of danger apply to someone of the first nations or is it is it that black people by nature of the heritage and the history It's not just non-whites, it's specifically black people who are in that degree of personal danger every day. Well, in some ways, I don't feel like I can give an, a definitive answer to that question because I, I don't want to speak beyond my direct experience. But what I can share with you, having spent some time on various reservations, particularly Pine Ridge in South Dakota with the mm -hmm. Lakota Sioux, there is an immense amount of criminalization of indigenous people. There's, there are indigenous women who go missing each year in epidemic numbers that no one knows why. There are cases of police officers committing acts of brutality on indigenous reservations. There are hmm. the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, is the federal agency that Um, provides some element of law enforcement on the reservation. And there's just the, the lineage of, of colonization is still very, very active here. Um, you know, you have people alive today who were um, forcibly taken from their parents and brought to boarding schools where they were tortured when they spoke their language or practiced any of their traditions, where their hair was cut, where... Um, they were forced to become Christian. And so the state of Maine actually is the first state in the United States to conduct a truth and reconciliation commission with indigenous peoples, primarily because the government sponsored this boarding school program, which was so obviously a form of cultural right. genocide. Wow. And so truth and reconciliation has been tried before, And the United States has a very interesting history of complex series of traumas. You know, it's not just mm. one tribe against another. It's, it's many different tribes of people being brutalized for a lot of different reasons. Um, so I see the process of truth and reconciliation combined with some sort of mm. intergenerational healing. And, and I think Joanna Macy's work, I love that you mentioned her, I feel like a lot of these modalities that have been on the fringes, I really see becoming part of a national healing movement. And, and I'm really a planetary healing movement. I mean, we've all experienced the pain of colonization, even as a colonized, even as a colonizer, there's, 
I think what's interesting about the Black Lives Matter movement this time around is there's a lot of Black leaders who are asking white people not just to look at how horrible racism is, but what are the deep-rooted cultural biases and pains that would create the notion of being able to to brutalize or dehumanize another human being. Like that, that has to be rooted somewhere deep in the psyche of people who've come from those lineages. And that's mm. our responsibility to to be in right relationship with with the full depth of that experience. Yeah. Because when you talk about indigenous wisdom, we would have to go back to before the Romans colonized Britain to connect with our mm -hmm. indigenous past, the, certainly the, the shamanic level of our indigenous past. And so 2,000 years of, of kind of post-Roman brutality, which we then shipped around the world very efficiently, is, mm -hmm. is it's a long time and many, many, many generations of disconnection from ourselves and from the land. Yeah, there is a lot of healing to be done, but this, it feels to me as if this year particularly, I've been doing this kind of work pretty much consistently for the last 20 years and I have never heard so many people talking in such depth and with such personal integrity and clear intent about the nature of the healing that needs to happen and that then can happen. And you were talking earlier about epigenetics and the knowledge that we now have that deep ancestral work can be done and we don't have to pass the brokenness onto the next generations. And and I would have thought understanding that helps us, gives us an incentive to do it. And that in itself is huge, that we carry so much pain and so much disconnection, but that healing inside one generation is possible. I'm thinking what arises for me is I grew up in Scotland where it sounds like your ancestors came from and before I knew much history of anything I knew about the Highland Clearances which was in entire very long term cultural cultural groups villages crofting communities just being uprooted put on a ship and sent to a new world to their and, and there then to perpetuate the damage that had just been done to them. And the whole thing is just deeply distressing if we let it become so. However, healing is possible. So that's it for the first part. We will release the second part shortly. I don't think we're going to make you wait a week because I wouldn't want to wait a week for the rest of this conversation. So in the meantime, enormous thanks to Benjamin for offering such breadth of vision and the beginnings of ideas of how we can genuinely change the outcome of the world around us. This feels like the intersection of Joanna Macy's three pillars of the great turning, holding actions with systems change, with shifting consciousness, all wrapped into one. So I will put links in the show notes to the One Nation site, to Ben's Medium post, and to Unity 2020. And we will be back shortly with the second half. In the meantime, thanks as ever to Caro C for the music at the head and foot of the podcast and for the sound production. Thanks to Faith Tillery for being the other half of the creative team that is Accidental Gods and for designing the website. If you want to go there, we're at accidentalgods.life and you'll find the show notes all the other podcasts, the visualizations and meditations in the resources section, and the Accidental Gods membership portal, which is a structured training designed to give everybody, you, your friends, your family, everybody you know, the means to connect with the web of life in ways that are grounded, authentic, and give us the answers that we need. So if you know of anybody else, who would like to be active in co-creating the birth of a new world, do send them this link. And that's it for now. See you soon.
Thank you and goodbye.